Hildy is a body chain smoking 70 something former journalist who lives on the Upper West Side in an apartment that has a portal back to 1973. Time travel has rules, though, and Hildy breaks them by traveling back with healthcare aide Trista. Now both women will have to come to terms with their pasts before they lose their chance at having a future. From Ahoy Comics comes Elisa Quitney's Guilt, that's G-I-L-T, a comic book that's Sex in the City meets the Golden Girls by way of the Twilight Zone. Call your local comic book store and ask them to order your copy of Guilt today. So this week, uh, y'all, if you haven't figured that out already by the odd little start here, uh, we are actually doing a um, a non-issue uh, based episode of Endless, just coming at you real quick. Um, we looked at the first issue. We had just switched from two issues per episode to one issue per episode. We're really, really enjoying that because it gives us the deep dive. Uh, but then we got to this one and we're like, well, hey, you know, as we're about to record, Maybe we should do both of those issues together because it's a to be continued. So it's really one narrative between the two issues. Can I just can I just for full disclosure say that it's it's also because I got confused (laughs) and just started (laughs) commenting on both issues in the same script. And And it's good that you did, because I think it's best that we end up talking about that. So that is going to be actually not the next episode of endless but that will be in um, a couple two episodes from now because next week we have an exciting special guest that we're going to interview i know i'm so excited about this elisa tell us who you got for this uh for this podcast for us to talk to we have got the mother of of the endless i guess (laughs) Karen Berger. So Karen, uh, we every week we talk about who was the editor. Uh, and there, you know, there are different kinds of editors. Obviously, there are editors who inherit things where, you know, and there are editors who really help bring the band together. Like the difference between mm-hmm. I'm spazzing out who the Beatles, the Beatles manager was was a uh, uh, you know, like the Beatles. A person. Yes. Right. Yes. Like the Beatles manager um, <laughs> that I. <laughs> Whoever that was. Yes. yes. So she, uh, she was obviously so instrumental in, you know, hiring uh, Neil mm-hmm. and Dave McKean and assembling the team. And uh, so she is going to be our special guest. Well, I'm very excited about that because I've never actually, aside from you, spoken to a comics editor before. And so to be able to kind of like talk about all of that process and um, and how it goes to like, you know, give birth to this idea, it's really, really exciting. So everybody, um, you know, be sure to hang out for next week. The other thing that we, uh, we kind of want to throw out there is that Elisa and I, at this point in our lives... Are incredibly unpredictable people. We're both really busy uh, every week. Uh, for those of you, you know, behind the scenes who are Patreon supporters at the ten dollar above level, are, are welcome to come in and like watch us live. But nobody ever does because we are never recording at the time that we say we're going to be recording because we always have to shift around during the week because everything's just really unpredictable. So what I want you guys to do as listeners is to understand that sometimes there's just not going to be an endless in your feed. Uh, we will do our best to be here for you every Tuesday, but we will not always make it. I just don't think, and especially in the upcoming like two to three months, um, things might be a little bit unpredictable. So we just want to let you know, we are going to always try to have something in your feed, but we may not. And when we don't, we ask your forgiveness um, and uh, and that you come back when there is something in your feed. Um, that said, we do kind of have some things that we want to talk about today. This is not just an episode to notify you that we will not be doing an episode, but we got some things to chat about. Oh, and, and- and some really exciting things because it's it's kind of like when you realize you don't have dinner to feed your your guests <laughs> and instead you assemble appetizers but there's some really fine appetizers and oh, they're yeah. like the little shrimp and the oil and the caviar mm-hmm. toast it's good stuff it's good stuff yeah so i'm really excited but the first thing that i want to talk about is the sandman uh, netflix show trailer that dropped last week because Oh my God. Um, 
this was it was so much fun for me to watch because I'm just kind of like I am, you know, behind the scenes in that I talk about this show, you know, um, on, on a podcast. Um, but you actually were part of the creative team that made it. And how did it feel to see something like, I mean, you didn't work on the part that they interpreted for this. That was a very beginning that was, you know, before you came on. Um, but you're still part of the creative team that created Sandman and that worked on this stuff. How does it feel to watch that material come to life like that? It feels really magical. It, it feels, I mean, just listening to the audible ha has felt mm -hmm. magical oh, for me because yeah. you've got this full cast and you have, you know, in the audible version, certain things are highlighted mm -hmm. and other things perhaps are not as emphasized as they are in the visuals. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that this feels in some ways, like it emphasizes the things I've noticed in the visuals in the comics, as well as, you know, that full drama that you get from from hearing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it it but in other ways, it just it feels like suddenly, you know, like that aha video, like you've plunged <laughs> through the comic book and into the world. Yeah, no, it's kind of awesome. Um, I, I was really excited when I saw that come up. I am, you know, as we've talked about, I do a lot of analysis of TV and movies and, and that kind of thing. Um, that's usually where I spend the bulk of my time. Working in comics and doing this podcast has been really incredible. It's kind of expanded my, my, uh, my space. But like, this is where... I, I look at it and I'm like, oh, yeah, I get this. I understand the visual language of film. I understand everything that they're doing. Um, I love the uh, the visuals of it, the, the sound work that they did, the music. Um, you know, it's like a minute and it's just this trailer that like basically tells us the, the setup, the premise, you know, um, back with Roderick Burgess um, uh, capturing Dream. Um, but it's just it's so incredibly intense and beautifully shot. And I cannot tell you how excited I am for the rest of it. Um, and you mentioned too, another thing that dropped is the the next um, bit of the Audible Sandman. We had the we had the first one, which brought us to the end of Dream Country, I believe. And then I think this next one starts with Season of Mists. I am so excited. I haven't gotten there yet. I'm trying not to get too far ahead, get too spoiled. I usually can only help myself by a couple of issues. I'm always like just one or two issues ahead. Um, but uh, but I'm very, very excited for that. And the second one is where you came in because you came in in Season of Mists, right? Which sounds like such a great line. Like I came in in Season <laughs> of Mists. <laughs> Yeah, it is a great line. Yeah, it's so exciting. I love it, it. It is. And I was thinking that, you know, when the Harry Potter, when Harry Potter was such a phenomenon, I know it's a little <laughs> more complicated for everyone right now, but just in the 90s, yes. when there mm -hmm. were the books and then the movies, and it felt like we could all go into this magical realm together. Mm -hmm. And then again, with Game of Thrones, I'm mm -hmm. getting that kind of a feeling with Sandman, like, oh, yeah. my gosh, a whole other wonderful magical universe has opened up just when the world itself is feeling kind of anti-magical, mundane yes. and bad mm -hmm. ways. Yeah. And reconnecting with magic and metaphor at a time like this is, you know, kind of an exciting prospect. You know, um, it's it's it doesn't suck. Um, I really enjoyed watching it. I love, I'm very excited for when we get into discussing the TV series as well, because I feel like that is going to kind of throw some light on everything that we've talked about um, in the comics as well and sort of add to that discussion. Um, the audible performance, I wouldn't call it an audiobook. It is a performance. Um, I cannot recommend highly enough to everybody. It is beautifully uh, performed. Um, we also had, there was a um, kind of like a promo shot of uh, Kirby Hal Baptiste as death, which just the shot and the look on, she's an amazing actress, you guys. Oh my God, she's so good. Um, so yeah, so like I, all of that stuff has just gotten me so incredibly excited about, about everything. Um, but one of the things also that I kind of wanted to talk to you about is like while we're doing this, where we're just kind of like sitting down and having a conversation about all of this, um, now that we've gotten a little bit into this, we've started talking about these comics. This is the first, is this the first podcast that you've hosted, right? 
yeah, this is this is mm -hmm. it. This is this is my virgin territory. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I had you as a guest on uh, Jed Bartlett is my president. So we had an episode of that. So you've done a little bit of podcasting. So you've had a little bit of that experience. But as a host, as somebody who's deeply um, involved in the planning and everything that goes on behind the scenes in the podcast, um, how does it feel now that we're at this point, we've been talking about this thing that you've been involved in, you're sort of revisiting, you're revisiting even your own book that you wrote, where you, there were things that you had forgotten that are now in that book that you go back to and you're like, hey, I wrote that. That's pretty cool. All right. Um, how does it feel to be talking about this, this stuff, you know, now that you've, uh, you've been away from it for a while? It's well, first of all, you know, I think that you, perhaps this is your virgin territory of comics where you're new to that. Mm -hmm. And I've been able to, you know, um, you know, guide you a little bit. But yeah. for me, you've done the same with with the whole, you know, the way you conduct podcast. And I think what I have loved about the experience of the podcast is how you have empowered me to screw up and just <laughs> say things as, you know, and just talk the way we actually would talk as friends yeah. and mm -hmm. go blah, 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 and, you know, go back and, <laughs> and, and not try to polish it and make it into something, you know, polished, but, but kind of a little detached. So I, yeah. I it, it feels wonderfully authentic. Um, <laughs> and in terms of revisiting the, the Sandman stuff, I think what is wonderful is what comes back to me and what is appalling mm -hmm. is when I discover that I have forgotten <laughs> huge chunks <laughs> of my life. And um, I think we're all, when you get to a certain age, maybe we all have it, you know, mm -hmm. when people are younger, you might have it with your childhood where you'll remember part of a memory or something mm -hmm. one way mm -hmm. and somebody else, your mom or your sibling or your friend will remember another aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, so in working in a really collaborative medium like comics, I am uh, occasionally dumbstruck by the fact that the past is a very much a different country. And it turns out I've forgotten much of what went down there. <laughs> it's kind of a little bit like the dreaming, right? <laughs> Everybody has their own little dreamscape, you know, and until a vortex comes in and like combines them to give you a complete story, you're just in your own little space. It is kind of neat, you know, how all of that stuff. My favorite thing is when you go back into your own book that you wrote about the experience and you are surprised and delighted by something that you discover there <laughs> that you wrote, you know. <laughs> Um, that's always really fun. I love working with you for so many reasons. I mean, first of all, I've always adored you. I think since the moment we met, probably, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, we've been like, oh, we got to do something together. And we, we had talked about doing comics some time ago. I had no experience with it and, and wasn't able to pull that off. But, um, but I love that we found a project that we can work on together and that I am, you know, in virgin territory for me in a lot of ways too. So like you have expertise that you bring in and guide me. And then I have expertise in podcasts casting that and come in and guide you. And so we're both kind of growing and we're both mentoring and um, and then just enjoying each other. And, you know, as far as like the the screwing things up, which I would put, you know, very hefty uh, quotation marks around because you're amazing. Um, is that I, I think that there is something to being um, being genuine and authentic when you are podcasting, um, because it's an incredibly intimate medium. You know, like you are literally the voice inside of somebody's head. And I feel like if people are going to invite me into their very personal spaces, um, that I need to earn that by being exactly who I am. Like I am exactly, I would say that off mic, I probably curse more. But other than that, like I try, I, I try to, you know, have my, my, my guests are over persona, you know, which is just where I behave myself a little bit more. Um, but it is, you know, and when I screw something up too, like there was, a, what was it? Scatological, I think was the big thing <laughs> where I didn't know what that meant. Um, and, and completely fine. Like, and, and I think, I don't want to pretend that I, um, have more of a grasp on things than anybody else, you know, because I think a lot of people do that, especially when they present a persona, you know, like here I am. And, and when you can carefully craft your persona, you know, your your Instagram persona where everything is all these wonderful, you know, foods that you're eating or whatever. And and we never capture, you know, the stuff that is is a little rougher, which everybody has. So so I try to, like, allow myself 
to uh, to be rough in a podcast, to make mistakes, to be wrong. Um, mostly the purpose of the podcast is about having the discussion, asking the questions and inviting people into that space. And I think that that's something that we do together really, really well. So I love that. Um, but learning about comics is so much fun and and really training myself to enjoy the visual. And when we get to talking about Into the Night and Lost Hearts, which we will be talking about not next episode, because we're talking Karen fucking Burger next episode. I'm very excited about that. Um, but the episode after, um, you know, I was really taken by so much of the, um, and I'll talk about this when we get there, but like the visual ways in which dreams are presented from different people and the different aesthetics that we get when we're in somebody else's dream space was just so incredibly beautiful. That's something that prior to this experience, I might have glossed over. You know, like I might have looked at it and been like, oh, well, that's neat, you know, and then not really thought about it. But now I'll actually spend a little more time on every page and really kind of take it, try to understand that everything, everything in a fiction story is a choice, you know, um, you know, to go back to uh, Hannah Gadsby and, and Douglas, that was a choice. If you haven't seen Hannah Gadsby's Douglas, just go watch it now. Um, but everything is a choice. And when everything is a choice, everything means something. You know, and so then you can go and look in and see what that meaning is. And I think that for me, I'm interested to see when we go back to television, because even in TV, I've always kind of ignored the visual. I'm always about the story. I always miss the visual cues. When we go back to the TV episode, you know, after having had this experience of living in the comic books with you for a while, how whether I'm going to be into the visual, whether I'm going to pick up visual things or not, I'm, I'm interested in seeing that. So that's so, so much fun. Um, but, you know. Here we are having this discussion. Uh, we had a couple of notes from the, uh, the episode that we're going to do later from these issues, the, the sort of ideas that were inspired by Into the Night, but that aren't necessarily about Into the Night. Um, so I wanted to kind of wave a little Lucian's library behind the scenes kind of stuff. We've got some other things to talk about. Um, so I, I would love for you to talk about um, dolls and manipulation and the problem with four weddings and a funeral. I love, by the way, that you bring in rom-coms, which is my territory my favorite uh genre is of course romantic comedy so i'm excited to have this discussion well and i think that's one of those places we've always connected i i have had sort of a two-track career in a lot of ways where part mm -hmm. of it has been comics and part of it has been romance and women's fiction mm -hmm. and um anyways i was thinking about desire and how the the uh, i'll probably end up repeating this but you know in the Sandman universe, death is much more upbeat and friendly and, you know, a good person slash entity. And mm -hmm. desire is capricious and cruel and, and kind of vapid. And mm -hmm. it's it's a very different version of desire because this, this desire plays with people as objects. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking how desire in romance, romance as a genre, is really about a very specific desire for mm -hmm. for a specific person and they cannot just be an object they really have to have free will and desire yeah. you back actually you always thought in harry potter that the love potion stuff was really upsetting because mm -hmm. part of what you want is you want someone to genuinely love you back not love you back because they've been yeah it doesn't have any meaning dosed with yeah exactly mm -hmm. And that got me thinking about four weddings and a funeral, uh, <laughs> as, as it does, because I've been thinking about rom-coms a lot. And our, our mutual friend, Jenny Cruzy, the writer, mm -hmm. I always remember I had this uh, idea about four weddings and a funeral, that it's a great film, except for this huge central flaw, which is that Andy McDowell's character, Carrie the American, Mm -hmm. should not have been the one who gets Hugh Grant's Charlie. It should have mm -hmm. been Kristen Scott Thomas's Fiona. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and that's a really great, uh, one of the things you can always count on Jenny is an astute observation of how stories should have been, you know? Um, and yeah, absolutely. I think that um, that's always something that bothered me, especially because Fiona in Four Weddings and a Funeral is a fully drawn character with an actual arc. 
Whereas Annie McDowell feels like, uh, you know, like not not un- entirely unlike a manic pixie, you know? Okay, wait, I just, I need to, okay, no one in that movie has a career. Nobody. I mean, as far as I can tell, <laughs> nobody goes to a job. I have no idea mm-hmm. what Hugh Grant or Scarlett, the, the, the petite redhead. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I don't know what they do. I don't even, well, Kristen Scott Thomas is one of the richest people in England because her brother is, mm-hmm. but okay. Yeah. So then mm-hmm. you've got Andy McDowell who comes in and she keeps going to these society or semi-society weddings. Mm-hmm. And she seems really eager to meet and marry someone English of a certain class. Mm-hmm. That appears to be her main motivation. There are moments when she seems to be acting as though she would like Hugh Grant to, you know, to, to pony up and, and say something. They sleep together after having had mm-hmm. maybe three words of conversation. And in the morning, <laughs> she plays this joke on him and she says, um, hey, aren't you going to marry me? And then it's, you know, the twist is, sorry, spoilers, mm-hmm. if you haven't seen this, is like, <laughs> oh, oh, I was joking. But I'm thinking, why would you joke about that? Why would you joke about someone having to marry you when you had only just met, barely mm-hmm. talked to them, even if you had stopped them? And I, I think <laughs> that the problem there is, she is, you know, an almost entirely unmotivated character. Well, she is. She's a character who is written entirely to be seen through the lens of Hugh Grant's character, right? Um, we never see her with her own kind of desires, motivations, goals. We don't really know anything about her. She simply exists so that she can say perplexing things that allow Hugh Grant to do that cute little bumbly Englishman thing that grabs all of our hearts, right? Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's she's just a flat character, whereas Fiona, I think actually has some traction there. You can, you can get Fiona. You got her vulnerabilities. You've got the things that she cares about. She's in love with somebody who doesn't love her back. That is a huge vulnerability. Um, You know, there's so much in Fiona that is interesting and challenging and fun. And she actually knows who Hugh Grant's and I can't even remember what Hugh's Hugh Grant. He's just Hugh Grant in four. Char- Charlie. But- Charlie's name. Oh, oh. Uh, yeah, yes. just two things about Fiona that really, because I've, I've just done a rewatch. So the first thing is, what a tragic ending. It ends, sorry, spoiler again. Yeah, she, she for ends, this 30-year-old movie, yes. yes in, in an <laughs> epilogue, you know, she's mm-hmm. sort of pictured with Prince Charles. And he's not even looking at her with love in this. He's just mm-hmm. gazing out stoically while she looks very happy to have, you know, netted him. And I'm thinking that is not our happy ending. We want someone who adores Fiona. Yeah. So that that's number one. Number two, why is she constantly picking tobacco out of her teeth? What is wrong with her cigarettes? If you notice throughout the entire movie, she's always picking tobacco out of her teeth. Yeah, I think that's what happens when you don't when you smoke the un- unfiltered. But she's hardcore though. She's smoking unfiltered cigarettes. She's in love with men who will never love her back. Both of them named Charles. Isn't that interesting? Oh, um, oh. there you go. Yeah. So um, yeah, it's it's a tragic story. It should be redone. I think that you and I should get the rights to it and do a revision screenplay and have that made um, because I think that we would kill that story. <laughs> I, I, but I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, I could, I could absolutely. Uh, yeah. Okay. I think there <laughs> is now, I, I think there is, a, is her name pronounced Mary McFarlane? Um, anyway, she's a British yeah. romance author. Mm-hmm. Really good. And I think she did one of her novels, seems to me like it might have been a riff, but you could yeah. do so many riffs on, on mm-hmm. four weddings and a funeral. You could take that inspiration. Yeah. And I mean, that's the wonderful thing, too, about writing is that you can take the inspiration of four weddings and a funeral, fix it. And that is not plagiarism, y'all. That is inspiration. You know, so I mean, take it, write it, rewrite it, fix it. Every story that is broken that you love. And I have a lot of them. Um, it's an opportunity to take it and and write it. And actually, anybody who is interested in doing something like that for NaNoWriMo, I'm going to be doing... 
I think NaNoWriMo this year, Ooh. where uh, National Novel Writing Month, November 1st uh, to 30th, uh, where you write 50,000 words in 30 days. Um, if I am not actively doing it, I'm going to be doing uh, inspirational posts and stuff like that for uh, for writers as well. So um, so that'll be really, really fun. Um, but yeah, like anybody who's doing NaNoWriMo doesn't know what to do. Take your favorite movie, story, whatever that is broken in ways that you would love to fix. Um brush it up, give it new characters, a new setting, and then uh, fix it, you know, because that can be loads of fun. And it's a completely legit thing to do. Um, so I love that um, observation, especially because we start out Doll's House talking about desire, we open with desire, desire is I, at this point, like at the beginning, you know, we get the sense that that, sh- that they are somehow setting up a dream for something. I don't know exactly what's going on with that. But um, but it is, you know, it is interesting that we do kind of like come around to desire again and how desire um, is something that is is kind of a fearful thing, because when you want something, it some it can take over. So the main thing that defines a protagonist is, of course, that they are in pursuit of an active goal, you know, Um, and in order to be in pursuit of an active goal, you must desire that goal, that outcome. So every story is essentially a story about desire. And here we are in a comic book series in which dreams are stories. You know, they are all stories. And yet we are so kind of afraid of and intimidated by desire and we can't really understand desire and whatever it is that they're doing. Um, But yet that's what stories are. Stories are always about the pursuit of a desire. Protagonist is in pursuit of something, want something which they do not have. And so they have to chase that. I find that kind of an interesting thing. I don't know. I don't know that I can do anything with it because I haven't read enough of Sandman to really see if that is where that premise comes from. But I find it really interesting that Dream is the king of stories, that that the Cain and Abel are his little story minions, you know, and yet here we are not comfortable with desire when that is the breeding ground of of storytelling. So, you know, you know, strangely enough, he's known as the king of dreams and the prince of stories. And I was right. just thinking about that. I think that may be taken a little bit from some of the mm-hmm. names and, and other names for Lucifer, but I'm mm-hmm. not sure why it's prince instead of king interesting oh my god there's so much fun stuff to work with um all right so something else that you had pulled out uh from lucian's library which is not really uh, it's a little spoilery so those of you who are sensitive skip ahead a little bit um is about matthew the raven this is a story that is just so bizarre to me uh it starts last week when i i went Mm -hmm. to the pet store my local pet store uh in rhinebeck to get Chewies for my dog mm-hmm. who greatly desires mm-hmm. them. And, um, and you know, my friend Doug who works there was saying, Hey, at least I've been listening to the podcast and it got me ah. thinking and I've been watching videos. And I saw this whole video doing a deep dive into the internet rumor uh, where this guy says that you saved Matthew the Raven from dying. Is mm-hmm. it true? And I said, okay, totally not true for three reasons <laughs> first of all what would i ever have the chutzpah to tell neil you know like what to write in his elaborately plotted out world mm-hmm. number two even if i had why would neil then say oh yes i've got this elaborate world i'm creating but no because you the assistant editor have a son with the same <laughs> name i will not i will not you know kill this character um, and, and third of all, you know, just why would it have bothered me? I, after I worked, I think this would have been about, oh, I'm trying to think a couple of years after. So when I first started working, um, I, I was engaged to be married. And then I had, I was about 30, I think when I had Matthew, my son, who mm-hmm. was not named after the Raven. And I said, it just, it, it, it was a coincidence. It was not, it wasn't named for the Raven, God damn it. And I, mm-hmm. it wouldn't have bothered me. So later, um, every once in a while, Neil will drop me a little message and say, you know, Hey, or he's, you know, listen to the podcast. And, mm-hmm. um, and so he did that. And I wrote and I said, 
funny story. There's this internet <laughs> rumor that I saved Matthew the Raven. Isn't that ridiculous? I, I make, you know, Neil, I told him it wasn't true. And I get this response. It was true. I said, <laughs> what? And he said, yes, your, your Matthew had just arrived on the scene. Um, and you asked me not to kill Matthew the Raven because of it. And I realized I also had, um, spoiler, I had, mm -hmm. I, I'll just leave it bigger. I plans for him that that would uh -huh. work and so uh you did save Matthew the Raven <laughs> and I said what the hell I mean do I just not remember my own past anymore and and Neil said the loveliest thing he said you mm -hmm. know I remember things that you don't remember you remember things I don't remember and Karen remembers things that we don't remember we remember <laughs> things Karen doesn't remember and then there's like a pause and then you see the little dots and then he says yeah but I think you should mention this now in your next podcast before you forget it again. <laughs> oh my God, that is so incredibly sweet. And I love what that says about the, um, the common story and community, you know, that like we each have a piece of our own story and then the people who are around us and who are part of our lives have the other pieces for it. And there's something kind of beautiful about that. Like everybody's sharing these pieces of story, which I think is wonderful. Uh, I'm also incredibly grateful to you uh, that this is true because Pat Oswalt, who is one of my favorite actors, my favorite comedians, I have loved him for years, um, is Matthew in the TV series. And so that means that because of you, I'm going to get more Matthew than I might have already gotten. So uh, so I'm incredibly grateful to you for that. And I'm grateful to Neil for making sure that we know that it's you that did it, whether you meant to or intended to or thought you were, uh, you were doing that at the time. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I just have to say that it, it reminds me how much of mm -hmm. a friendship this was because I, you know, mm -hmm. if, if I, I guess we all rewrite the past a little, mm -hmm. but Neil really quickly, I mean, we, we talked a lot, obviously it started out as completely a professional relationship, mm -hmm. but he really became a friend and he became a friend because he is a really connected person. And yeah. so I thought that was a very empathic thing to do. And, yeah. um, I, uh, oh, at some point I'll have to tell you some of my funny pregnancy and Neil stories, which involve. <laughs> which involve glitter, but not today. <laughs> well, I'm very excited to hear those. And that's so cool. And I'm excited that like, you know, we're doing this thing. And that's helped you kind of reconnect with some old friends, which yeah. is always fun. And, you know, really exciting. And the fact that I'm a huge fan of you and all of your friends just makes it all that much better for me. So I love all of that. Um, yeah, so uh, we're going to be coming back with the uh, Karen Berger interview next week. And I'm very, very excited about that. Um, but also, Lisa, you're kind of up to stuff. What's going on with you in the coming days, I coming am weeks? I up to stuff. So um, let's see. I am going to be at New York Comic Con. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know who else has got with the pandemic and everyone, you know, who knows? Right. I'll mm -hmm. be there. Um, Buddy Scalera, who um, hosts. When are you going to be there? So it's Saturday, this Saturday from 1230 to 130. <laughs> Okay, here's the thing. This podcast isn't going up until Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will just, I'm going to talk about where I will have been then. <laughs> okay. so, I don't know. Yeah. We'll so, tweet about it. Okay. We'll tell everybody in a tweet. Mm -hmm. Well, so I will be at, I will be doing a panel with Buddy Scalera, who is the host of Comic Book School. And uh -huh. I am going to be reading out a book of Mystic Use script. And mm -hmm. um, a bunch of, uh, let's see, it's three great artists are going to mm -hmm. be illustrating it while, you know, in real time. And then we'll get to compare their uh, interpretations oh with Mike Norton, who was the artist who, who did that back in 2017, 2018. Oh my God, that's so awesome. I love that. Now I want to go, but I can't because I got to do stuff here this weekend. <laughs> well, I think that's great. I think even, you know, as, as equally as exciting as this is the fact that you are coming to visit me yes. for, for Sheep and Wool. 
For sheep and wool, I am very excited about that. The sheep and wool um, fair that happens every year in Rhinebeck, New York. I grew up in the town right next to Rhinebeck. Um, and uh, and so it's it's really, really fun for me to be able to go back kind of home. And you live down in that area. So I'm going to come down. I'm going to visit you. We're going to hang out. We're going to record some. And then we're going to go and visit the sheep and wool festival where I will buy an inordinate amount of really, really nice yarn. So I'm very excited about uh, that whole thing. And oh, another thing that was really funny that happened this week is I'm, I'm, you know, scrolling through like, you know, I don't know what it was, one of doom scrolling somewhere on social media. And I see this headline that says, you know, Bard Professor has, uh, you know, has show on Netflix or whatever. And I was like, oh my God. And, you know, like I grew up in Red Hook, which is where Bard is, you know. Um, I went to school with Sarah Botstein, who was um, Leonard Botstein's daughter, and he was the president of Bard and famous dude and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I'm like, oh, you know, I knew some people who worked at Bard. I knew some professors. Some of my friends' parents were professors that taught at Bard. Like, I wonder if that's anybody I know. So I click on it, and it's Neil Gaiman. And I was like, okay, yes. Technically, Neil Gaiman is a bard professor. Like, yes, absolutely. I will absolutely concede the point. However, I I think that's a little bit like a little bit much. I'm like, yes, he is a bard professor, but that is like four levels down on his CV. Like that's, you know, that's not the top of the list. Um, So I just found that to be so incredibly cute and such a, you know, locality first way of just reframing everything that ever happens around Neil. So whenever Neil does anything, I think everybody should have the headline be bard professor, you know, as as the as the first identifier. I love it. What would be your version of bard professor, Lonnie? You know, so if, if instead of identifying you by the thing you're best known for or the second <laughs> most, what would that be for you? Uh, lady who owns too many cats. Like this is, <laughs> you know, I'm just I'm a lady who owns too many cats. And I think that should be my primary identifier. How about you? What is your primary identifier? I was thinking also it would be like crazy dog owner. <laughs> Well, I think that that is how we should sign off today. I am Lonnie Diane Rich, owner of Way Too Many Cats. And I am, I am, uh, you know, Wrangler of a Chinook. Yes. Alisa Quitney. I have a name. Alisa (laughs) Quitney. Don't forget. Um, All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Again, we appreciate your patience. We appreciate your, um, you know, like just waiting for whenever the next episode comes. We will try to do this every week, but it will not. There are going to be weeks where we're just not going to be able to make it and that'll happen. Um, And in the coming weeks, uh, we're going to have the Karen Berger interview. Um, We're going to have the podcast that we do together, which I think is going to be where we discuss Into the Night and the lost hearts so that's going to be really fun and and in the words of matthew the raven whatever